see you this morning. It's good to be here. Uh, welcome to the folks that are streaming with us. Um, uh, it's good to be home. It's good to be at Big Lick. I'm always thankful for an opportunity to fill this pulpit. I uh, thank uh, Jeff for inviting me to do so this morning. Let's open with a word of prayer. Uh, we don't have special music, so we're going to jump right in. Okay? <laughs> Buckle up. All right? Let's pray together. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this day. God, thank you for a, a time to worship together, Lord. Thank you for uh, these different avenues that you've given us so that folks can tune in, folks can watch from our fellowship building, God, and folks can, can gather in here, Lord. We're thankful that regardless of the circumstances, your word can still be proclaimed. We might still worship you. Father, for those that are traveling, for those that are on vacation, God, for those who are sick, for those who could not be here for other reasons, we ask that you would uh, grant them peace, grant them safety, and God, bring them back at the next appointed time. Lord, there are most certainly requests for prayer that are not known to me, but Lord, you know them all. And God, we ask that, uh, that you would, we thank you, God, that you hear our prayers. And Lord, we ask that you would grant uh, answers to those prayers in your timing and according to your will. Lord, uh, might those who don't know you this day uh, come into a saving relationship with you. Lord, I ask uh, that you would uh, grant your wisdom to all those who are proclaiming your word today. Uh, here in Stanley County, God, and across the world. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning again. And this feels a little different because I'm used to, like, somebody singing and then having to watch and be like, well, come up now. Is that? Yeah. But that's not happening because I'm just here. So David granted me this responsibility. Thank you, David. Uh, I'll add that to my invoice. Is that? I don't think I'm going to do that, do I? So this morning we're going to be in Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah. Chapter 29, Jeremiah 29, if you'll turn there this morning. We're going to spend some time uh, reading the words of this prophet uh, and talking through uh, sort of what God would say through him. Uh, this morning, uh, if I were going to, this sermon does not have a title. If I were going to title it, I might would just call it, For I Know the Plans I Have for You. We're going to look at a text that's fairly popular. Many of you are familiar with this text. If you're not, you may recognize it as we read it. It's often quoted. You've probably heard the 11th verse of this passage quoted many, many times. You might have seen it on a decorative pillow or displayed at your local Hobby Lobby. Today, though, we are going to look at the beginning of Jeremiah 29 and explore how God offers encouragement through this scripture but how that encouragement may not come in the form that we think it ought to. We're going to primarily deal with verses 4 through 14, but it's important that we understand exactly what is going on here. Jeremiah is the longest of the prophetic books. In it, we can find despair. We can find some fairly depressing language. Often, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. We see a theme of God's people turning away from him and punishing them, and God punishing them for it. We also, though, see hope for restoration for the people and ultimately for all people through the future sacrifice of Jesus Christ our Lord. Jeremiah began his prophetic ministry in 627 B.C. during the reign of King Josiah. At the time, Judah was caught between two empires that were struggling with one another for power. You had the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire in this constant struggle for who was going to be in charge. The Babylonian Empire was looking to expand, and there were multiple efforts to do so. In 612, the Babylonians took control of the capital city of Assyria, which was Nineveh. After a later battle with Assyria and Egypt, the Babylonians would ultimately defeat the Assyrians and Egyptians at the Battle of Carchemish, which would grant them control over Judah. King Jehoiakim of Judah later rebelled against Babylon, and King Nebuchadnezzar sent his army to punish Jehoiakim and those in Judah. Jehoiakim then took the throne, surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar, and he, along with many of the other leaders in Judean society, 
were taken into exile, an exile that would ultimately last seven years, and that is where we find ourselves in the 29th chapter of Jeremiah. The first few verses of Jeremiah 29 offer some contextual information for us, and we know that this text is a letter from Jeremiah sent to the people who are already in exile in Babylon, and we'll find that they are focused primarily on getting out. That may sound like a familiar situation to you in some regard. That is why this text is so important for us as we seek to live our lives here on earth as the people of God. Would you read with me Jeremiah chapter 29? We'll start in verse 1. We'll read through verse 14. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining exiled elders, the priests, the prophets, and all the people Nebuchadnezzar had deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King uh, Jeconia, the queen mother, the court officials, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metalsmiths had left Jerusalem. He sent the letter with Elasa, son of Shaphan, and, <coughs> and Jamaria, son of Hekiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. The letter stated, This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourselves and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for when it thrives, you will thrive. For this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Don't let your prophets who are among you and your diviners deceive you, and don't listen to the dreams you elicit from them, for they are prophesying falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them. This is the Lord's declaration. For this is what the Lord says. When 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's Declaration Plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. You will call to me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. This is the Lord's declaration. And I will restore your fortunes and gather from you all of the, gather you from, excuse me, all the nations and places where I banished you. This is the Lord's declaration. I will restore you. To the place from which I deported you. Let's pray again together. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, thank you for what it does, Lord. And we're thankful that your word is useful for teaching, correction, rebuking, and training in righteousness. And Father, we ask that you would do those things to us today through the proclamation of your word. Lord, uh, might we take what you would have us here, God, give us open minds, open hearts, that we might live with a posture of open hands. We ask these things again in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so beginning, we're going to begin. We've got some context. Verses 1 through 3 are basically there to give you just that, a little bit of context about why we are where we are and why this letter is being written. So looking in verse 4, look in verse 4 through 7 here, I want you to see first that God is responsible for the deportation of the people. God takes clear responsibility for where these individuals are at at this time. In verse 4, the Lord is clear that he is responsible for this deportation. He planned the exile, and he put it into motion. To clarify that, God did not deport them for his own entertainment. He's not some kind of cosmic bully. In this situation, the people of Israel got themselves into this predicament. They opted for disobedience, and God has opted for discipline. We know that suffering comes as a consequence of sin. And we know that all suffering is a result of the broader curse of sin. So if you're suffering in some form, even now, don't get caught up in tracking your trespasses in an effort to figure out why you are where you are. Do, however, take time to reflect on what your contribution, what our contribution could be. Sometimes you'll find an answer and other times you may not. Either way, self-reflection is an important part of this life that we live, regardless of what you find, though, the rest of this text still remains relevant. When it comes to your, your suffering, your difficulty, it's sort of like a cake, maybe a bad cake, right? 
You can bake one or it can show up on your doorstep, but you have to decide what to do with it. It doesn't matter how you landed, where you landed, you, you now have to figure out how you're going to live in light of your circumstances. So God tells the exiles to make themselves at home. The Lord is preparing these Israelites for an extended stay in Babylon and even tells them to set up shop there. In his instructions to them, the Lord further reiterates the longevity of their stay. For people to marry and then to have children who will then marry points to a significant amount of time. We know later in this text it's going to be 70 years. We aren't to imagine that the Israeli exiles were suddenly pleased and excited to be in Babylon, though. It isn't as if the Lord gave these instructions and everything immediately changed for them. No. There was plenty of work to be done. So what do you do when you're in a place you didn't expect to be in? How are you going to respond? Maybe you have some sort of situation now. That you're, you didn't really expect. I, I would imagine we all have a common, a common situation now we didn't quite expect to be in about three or four months ago, right? So how are we going to handle that? Some of us are inclined to react by curling up and retreating. Others of us are inclined to fight and push against everything that comes our way. Others are compelled to try and find a way out of their situation. But none of those things are what God commands of these Israelites. He tells them to cultivate their circumstance. If I can give you a simplistic and maybe sort of silly example, uh, it's not really a secret to a lot of folks that I, I really don't like snow. Uh, now, it's pretty. I like to watch it fall. But because I grew up here, and most of you did too, uh, when we get about a quarter of an inch, everything just shuts down, and it ruins my entire plan for everything. I, I can't go to work, I can't do what I want to do, I'm stuck wherever I'm at. So I don't, I don't really like it that much. So uh, when it begins to fall, I know it won't be long before I can't get out of the house or go to the store or go wherever I want to. I can't just get out on the road if I want to. I know that I'm about to lose some freedom, and I don't much care for it. Even so, when the snow begins to fall, there's nothing I can do about it. It's a reminder of my powerlessness, and I have to figure out what I'm going to do with it. Am I going to hunker down for days and complain about the weather? I'm inclined to. Am I going to somehow think I can stop the snow with my grievances? Both of those would be pretty absurd. Instead, I'm tasked with figuring out how I might brave the cold and live with it. After I come to grips, with the weather, I may venture outdoors to play in the snow. I may enjoy a bowl of snow cream, if any of you are making that, right? Perhaps I begin to see beauty in something I don't really like that much. That's kind of where the Israelites are, and that is what God is commanding them to do. Their complaints or worries about exile are not going to remove them from it. So to sit and mope is not going to help them either. We can get so caught up in trying to find a way out of our circumstances that we fail to flourish in them. Getting so caught up in what we perceive and what we see that we can't even glorify God in our present circumstances because we're so worried about getting out of them. How are you responding to your circumstances today? Are you fighting them? Are you so focused on getting out of them that you can't focus on honoring God in them? I could give you the example of our, our little pandemic here, right? Just a little pandemic, just a little global pandemic, right? If I could give you that example, there are so many opportunities for ministry, for gospel sharing, for loving others, for taking care of your neighbor in this time. But sometimes we get so caught up in, in the, the drag of it or the politics of it, that we can't seem to find a place where we can really glorify God in the midst of it. And friends, that is sinful. Let it not be said that we were so intent on moving ourselves that we wasted days or months or years or even a lifetime neglecting our relationship with God and our God-given responsibility to share his love with others. I don't want to look back in 10 years and see all the opportunities I missed to know God better because I was so focused on the things around me that I lost sight of who he is. 
I don't want to look back and have to come face to face with the fact that people didn't hear the gospel because I was so caught up in my own perceived misery that their eternity took a back seat. We have to stop waiting on our circumstances to subside and start living for Jesus in the midst of them. Your joy is not determined by your circumstances anyway. Pray continuously for your situation and for the environments that you wish you were not in. Because when those environments thrive, you will too. That's what the prophet Jeremiah is writing here in, in chapter 29 of these exiles. Pray for Babylon. You don't want to be there, I get it. But pray for the place, because when it does well, so will you. Looking at verses 8 and 9, for this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Don't let your prophets who are among you and your diviners deceive you. Do not, in the midst of your difficulties, seek answers from man. How often do we try to do that? So often we find ourselves on YouTube or uh, another site of some sort, right, looking for these, like, self-help talks. Right, watching TED Talks, if you know what those are, to try to get some answer that, because we don't understand what's going on around us. As the Israelites are dealing with this exile, there are individuals among them who claim that they prophesy in the name of the Lord, and they're telling them that it will all be over soon. Hold on just a little longer. It's all going to be okay. These diviners are offering that they have the answers, answers to the questions of how they might get out of their situation. Answers to how much longer they might be in their situation. They are false prophets, and they are not offering godly advice. This certainly nips the bud of the prosperity gospel, doesn't it? It kills our American folk religion that offers the way out of our circumstances if we just do the right things. What's more is that the Israelites are seeking this kind of advice from these false prophets. They're actually running towards it. Can you imagine as a church, if in this time, if in this time of uncertainty, or in your own personal time of uncertainty, if people around you see you leaping to politicians or leaping to experts for answers on how you might live your life, certainly we listen to those. Certainly we listen to the advice of people who, who maybe know some about what we're dealing with. But we don't run to mankind for comfort. We don't run to mankind for all the answers. We all like to hear what we like to hear, though, don't we? When someone offers advice or counsel that makes us feel good, we tend to return to them for more. When we don't hear what we want to hear, we don't always react kindly. So if I go to the doctor and get on the scale and he's like, man, you're perfect, I'm going to go back. <laughs> right? I'm gonna, I might pay extra just to hear that. You know, it, uh, when I go to one, he's like, you, you could shed a few. You know, uh, typically I'm okay, but if it's the wrong day, I might just think, who are, who do you think you are? <laughs> right? That's the, I am beautiful. Right? That's a very like, even in his medical advice, I can sometimes not be real receptive to it. Okay. So when we don't hear what we want to hear, we don't always react kindly. We don't always walk away with this sense of, I needed that. The Israelites are hearing something that they like from these prophets, but it isn't the truth. If what others are telling you doesn't match up with what God is telling you, don't listen, even if it sounds good. Further, God will never lead you in a direction that is contrary to his word. So as we seek answers, as we seek advice, even in this sort of difficult time, it's important to remember, incredibly important to remember, uh, that when you're talking about how you're going to live, how you're going to thrive, how you're going to serve others, how you're going to show and be a Christian example during this time, man does not have the answer, only God does. So in verses 10 through 14, we find that God has a good purpose. He says, for this is what the Lord says, when 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. Understand that clarifier is incredibly important. God does not say, I'm going to let you out early. Okay, if you're good, you can get out on good behavior, right? Uh, we'll, we'll send you out to work. That's not how this works. God says, when 70 years are complete, when you have finished what I have planned for you, 
When you have completed the time I have ordained for you, I will attend to you and confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. Here's kind of where the rubber meets the road, okay? Verse 11, we, we know that one pretty well, for I know the plans I have for you. God has a good purpose. We've made it down to verse 11, which is one of the most commonly quoted, unfortunately sometimes misquoted, verses in Scripture. Unfortunately, this verse has been used for quite some time to push the idea of American folk religion, uh, prosperity gospel, or moralistic therapeutic deism, which boils down to the idea that God's ultimate goal is here to make you happy on earth, right? If you just, just be good, God will make you feel good, uh, and he's just this transcendent being who doesn't want anything to do with you personally, right? This idea that God is only here to make us happy, that he's like our vending machine, and that as long as we do what we're supposed to do, everything's just going to work out fine for us. Understand that a 70-year exile means that some people will never see the end of that exile. They will die in exile. So a promise that, oh, hold on for one more day and you're going you're gonna to get out is not true for some of the people in this exile. This, this is where they will end their earthly lives. It's important to remember that as we, as we march ahead. And it may sound discouraging, but be encouraged because God has a good purpose. Too many people are buying the lie that God exists only that we may never suffer or that we may always be delivered from the situations that we find ourselves in because of the curse of sin. But that, that's not it. When we read Jeremiah 29, 11, with that mentality, we are in effect ignoring the rest of the book. Jeremiah is a book that it's all about uprooting the plans of his people. Plucking them out from where they are. Taking them out of their comfort. Take solace in that verse, but don't take a false comfort. Yes, God had a plan for Jerusalem. Yes, God had a plan for the Israelites. Yes, God's plan was for their good. But God's plan absolutely involved them being exiled for 70 years. The Lord's plan involved discomfort. The Lord's plan involved difficult circumstances. God's plan involved things that the Israelites may not have seen coming. But God's plan and purpose were truly and fully good. Do not let the devil tell you that something God says is good is not. So where's the hope then? If God is not promising deliverance from specific circumstances, if not comfort, if not ease, where's the hope? If God isn't going to take me out of this difficult time, what am I going to do now? Our hope. Your hope and my hope is found in Christ. We still find hope in the promises of God, including this one. God's promises are true, and our God is incredibly faithful. We can find comfort in Christ in our circumstances. We can find rest in Jesus. John 16, recounts Jesus as saying that in this world we will have trouble, but take heart. He has overcome the world. Christ has overcome it all. He is a Savior who knows our experiences and who understands where we are coming from. He's felt what we feel. He's, he's hurt where we've hurt. He's wept like we've wept. God tells his people that they will call to him and he will listen. We have a great mediator in Jesus Christ. We can talk to the Father whenever and wherever. Our Savior is still our wonderful counselor. He is Emmanuel, who is God with us. You do not have to suffer or be in your exile alone. Call upon the Lord. We find our hope in Christ, and we find our hope in the message of the gospel. When God tells the Israelites that his plans are for their good, he means it. 
God's purpose is to bring them closer to himself, even though it means a time of hardship. God's ultimate purpose is to bring his people into a closer communion with himself. For us, this is the process of sanctification. God continuously working on us to make us more like his son in preparation for eternity. In Romans 8.28, we find a New Testament example of scripture that speaks for our good, but that doesn't necessarily mean it is for our comfort. We hear from Paul that all things work together for the good of those that love God, who are called according to his purpose. Once more, this speaks of our becoming more like the Savior. As God speaks to the Israelite people, he promises restoration, but he is pointing to more than just a return to their original land. Do not read this and think God is promising a return to their original land. Yes, he is, but he's pointing to something far greater. God is promising an ultimate sacrifice that is going to completely flip this system that got the Israelites where they are now in the first place. He's pointing to Jesus Christ. You may ask yourself, so what's that mean for us? What then is God's promise to me? If not that I'm going to get out of his circumstance, what's his promise? Well, God's promise is not that you're going to get your dream job. His promise is not that you're going to get into the school you applied to. God's promise is not that you're going to get the girl or the guy you've been after. God's promise is not that your job will get easier. He doesn't promise health and wealth and prosperity. God doesn't promise that your earthly hopes and dreams will be fulfilled. He doesn't promise that your plans won't be crushed. The promise is not that all of your problems will dissipate and that life will suddenly become far easier for you than it is right now. Nope. The promise is that the God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead to conquer death, hell, and the grave will raise you up with him, and that is enough for us. Is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ enough for you? Is the cross your completion? Is Jesus your living hope? If he's not, then you will almost certainly never find rest in these troubled times. I'm going to ask Reba to come up and play for us. We'll just take a moment to sort of uh, have an invitation where we are. Deliverance comes through the cross of Christ, and the promise that we will one day see him face to face should be more than sufficient for us. The grace that only Christ can offer is the good news, and deliverance from sin and shame is far greater than any other deliverance we could ever seek or ask for. Rescue from your current circumstance cannot compare to the rescue that you experience from sin and shame and bondage through Christ our Lord. So when the winds blow, do not be discouraged. When the waves crash, do not be overcome. When the world around you seems to be falling apart, do not crumble with it. This may not be where you thought you'd be. This may not be what you wanted. But you can rest and know that no matter how hard or how long or how frightening things may seem, there is a God who has a plan that is for your good, whether you see it now or not. Even when you don't see it, our God is working. Even when we can't seem to feel it, he is, he is moving. Even when it seems like you are at the end of the road, he has made a way. So take heart, church. Our God knows the plans he has for each of us. And yes, they may bring difficulty and discomfort. Your life may not be what you thought it'd be, and you will have to rest in knowing that God knows better than we ever could. So serve our Savior and get to work sharing the love of Jesus because a lost world is depending on it. Flourish where the Lord has you now. A whole generation is depending on us to leave them with a church that is further along than it was before we got here. Our time is short, and God's plans will come to fruition, so don't sit on the sidelines sulking. Don't give in to the lie that God has abandoned you. I promise he is closer than you imagined that he could be. He is present in the ease, and he is present in the difficulty. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Trust him and obey him. 
and seek him. Maybe you're here today and you're going through something that has taken you by surprise. Maybe you've had trouble dealing with it. Maybe you haven't found hope in Christ. Or you may not even know him. I want you to take a moment and close your eyes with me and bow your heads. Build yourself an altar where you are. Think about how God may be speaking to you. Think about in the presence of your difficulty where you are finding Jesus. And if you're not, take this time to meditate on where you might seek him. God, forgive us for believing that your plans are supposed to always align up with ours. Forgive us for believing that you owe us something. God, forgive us for our doubt and remind us that your plans are beyond our understanding. Remind us of your good purpose to make us more like our wonderful and merciful Savior. May we not forget that everything is worth losing for a closer walk with you, our creator and our sustainer. Thank you, Jesus, for, for dying on a cross. God, thank you for sending your son to live a sinless life, die an unfair death. And God, thank you for raising him from the dead on that third day. That we might be free from our sin, free from our shame, free from our shackles. And Lord, find hope in the gospel of your son, Jesus, in every circumstance we face. Lord, as we go... Make us instruments of your peace. Lord, make us proclaimers of the gospel. And God, might we all return at the next appointed hour. Lord, might we find ways to worship you and serve you this week and in the weeks to come. While we're in times of uncertainty and Lord, when things may seem a little more stable. God, may our commitment to the gospel, may our commitment to the community, may our love for those who live around us never cease, regardless of what's going on. In, a, in our context. Father, we thank you again for this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Folks, thank you for being here today. Uh, I'm going to end with a benediction from Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>